Well, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody, depending on where you find yourself on this beautiful planet of ours today. Welcome to another exciting event at Astrofest, Astrofest 2020. It's a collaboration between SciFest Africa, South Africa's National Science Festival, which has gone virtual this year, and the South African Astronomical Observatory, which celebrates its 200 years of existence as an astronomical observatory this month. My name is Anya Free. I'll be your chair for today. And in my other lives, I'm a friend of SciFest and the SAO, and project director of broader impacts at the National Radio Astronomy Observatory in Charlottesville, Virginia, USA. And before we continue, uh, may we at the NRAO offer our sincere and official congratulations to the SAO on their anniversary. A few front of house rules and requests before I introduce our guests and guides for today. We welcome viewers on Zoom as well as SciFest Africa and the SAA, SAAO Facebook pages today. If you have any questions for our guests, um, please post these in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen if you are on Zoom or in the comment sections if you are joining us via Facebook. Please also understand that because we are broadcasting across three platforms, we may not have time to get to your question, but you are certainly welcome to reach out to us at the NRAO um, afterwards. Mm -hmm. So the USA's National Radio Astronomy Observatory designs, plans, constructs, and operates world-class radio astronomy um, facilities for use by the international scientific community. These facilities include the Kolji Jansky Very Large Array, um, otherwise known as the VLA, which sits on the plains of St. Augustine in New Mexico and is the instrument you see behind me. We also have the Atacama Large Millimeter or Submillimeter Array in the Atacama Desert of Chile, and the Very Large Baseline Array, an interferometer, which consists of 10 25 meter dishes positioned across the USA from the Virgin Islands all the way across to Hawaii. So today in celebration of the 40th anniversary of the Col G. Jansky VLA, our education and public outreach team in New Mexico, led by NRAO STEAM Education Manager Summer Ash, will take you on a virtual tour of this astronomy workhorse, currently the most versatile and productive radio telescope in the world. Summer has studied and worked as both an engineer and an astrophysicist. She went on to focus on science education and outreach during her 10 years as a teaching fellow and the outreach coordinator for Columbia University's Department of Astronomy before joining us here as, as a member of our EPO team. Joining Summer is NRAO education specialist, Faith Fowler. Faith attended the University of Michigan where she received her BSc in space, engineer, space science and engineering with minors in physics and astronomy and astrophysics and her master's in space science. She has worked at NRAO for over three years. Also in the virtual tour, you will meet tour guide Tyler Cohen and VLA operator Sylvia Kowalski. Tyler is a graduate student at New Mexico Tech working on his PhD in astrophysics and has been a VLA tour guide for three years. While Sylvia dual majored in physics and astronomy and drama as an undergraduate at the University of Washington. She started at NRAO two and a half years ago and is one of seven of our VLA operators. And with that, it's my great pleasure to hand you over to our STEAM education manager, Summer Ash. Mm -hmm. Summer. Thanks, Anya. Um, I'm just going to briefly introduce the video we have we were playing we will be playing a recording from our October 10th 40th anniversary event which took place a couple of weeks ago on a Saturday um, and my team hosted a, a day long event um, including two tour opportunities one of which we will show you now so um, keep in mind that you know with every streaming event these days there are sometimes little technical difficulties so those are captured on a recording so you get to relive them. Um, with us. And one of the things that we will be doing during the tour for you, you will hear it mentioned in the recording, um, but we put links in the chat for our viewers um, for some of the resources that we'll, we will be highlighting. So I will go ahead and also do that during this tour when they are called out for you. Um, and that will be in the chat. But as Anya said, and as the recording, um, Faith will re it, um, reiterate, please use the Q&A for all of your questions. So um, with that being said, uh, whoever's in charge of the magic, um, please start the tour.
Hello, everyone. So my name is Faith Vowler. I'm the Education Specialist coming at you today here from Socorro, New Mexico. And also with us today, we have uh, Tyler Cohen, one of our tour guides. And we have Montana Williams, another one of our tour guides. And um, so Montana, feel free to turn on your screen. Oh, I think for some reason the screen share came undone. My bad. Here we go. And um, and then we also have uh, our operator, Sylvia, who will be joining us for later today. And so, um, well, so thank you so much for being here today. Actually, October 10th, 2020 is the VLA's 40th birthday. So 40 years ago on this date in 1980 was when we first dedicated the very large array and when it was officially open. And we've come a long way since then. And so Tyler's going to tell you a lot more details about uh, the VLA and how it works in a few moments. But first of all, some housekeeping things to get out of the way. So this webinar is going to last about an hour. And uh, for the, if you have any questions that you want to ask us throughout, we'll be doing a few Q and A uh, sessions at different times. We'll do one about any questions you may have about what Tyler talks about. And then we'll be doing a second Q and A session for uh, Sylvia, our operator. And so please submit your questions into the Q and A feature. Uh, we are going to be using the chat and, um, throughout and so we want to make sure that uh, your questions don't get buried in there. We're going to be posting links for things that uh, we'll have several websites throughout the presentation and so we'll be posting the links in the chat and we don't want your questions to get buried. So please put them in the Q&A feature. And if you see that the question you want to have, ask has already been asked by somebody else, instead of resubmitting the same question another time, please uh, just uh, upvote the question. And that way uh, it'll go higher up in the Q&A and we'll be able to see uh, which questions have a lot of people who want to ask them and we'll be able to prioritize those. So please um, primarily use, if you have a comment rather than a question, that can go in the chat feature. And um, also, if you are having any technical difficulties, if you can't hear us or anything like that, you can put that in the chat feature as well. So we also have a poll that we want to ask you that will um, be popping up momentarily. So we want to know who uh, uh, here has visited the VLA before and who is not, and also where you're coming from today, what part of the world. So we'll give it a few uh, seconds to answer that. And as um, that poll continues to fill up, then, um, there we go, sorry. Um, and so you can see, here's what the bottom of your Zoom window looks like. So the chat um, shows you where the chat and the Q&A are if you want to use those. Uh, here we go. And we'll, while we will do our best to answer as many questions as we can, it's pretty likely that we're not going to be able to answer all of them. And so if, you're, if you ask a question and it doesn't get answered during the tour, what you can do instead is go to our website and use our Ask an Astronomer feature. And so there's a whole list of archives of many other questions that people have asked before. So you can search the archives, see if your question's in there. And if it's not, then you can submit a new question and the answer to that question will be posted most likely within uh, 72 hours. And um, then, we are going to, at a few different times during this presentation, hopefully, if technology works out okay, we will be uh, showing you some videos from our VLA Explorer on our website. So this is a whole series of videos that are usually just a few minutes long that talk more about a lot of different features of the VLA. And um, so Montana ha uh, will post that in the chat. And, um, so we're not going to have the chance to show you all of those VLA Explorer videos. So the link is there for if you would like to go check it out on your own. All right, so now we will end the poll here.
So it looks like we've had, we have about 70% of people who have never been to the VLA before. So uh, that's great. And if you ever get, do get the chance to visit us, hopefully visit us sometime uh, in the future, once COVID is behind us, then we look forward to having you. And uh, for those of you who have visited before, welcome back virtually. It looks like we have a lot of people coming from North America today, but then we also have some folks from Europe and South America and uh, the Oceania region. So thanks so much for coming. So now I am going to hand this over to Tyler. Thanks, Faith. Wow, a lot of good questions in the chat already. Um, yeah, this is, uh, this is the second tour of the day. Um, and uh, a lot of the stuff that I'm gonna talk about has been talked about um, over the course of the day. But uh, if you're joining, if you've joined us late or you caught the tail end of some of the talks, this might give a little context to that. Um, so here at the VLA, astronomers are interested in studying radio frequency light from space. Uh, throughout this discussion and, and probably throughout, you know, if you've been here throughout the day, you've heard the word frequency a lot. Frequency is the word that astronomers use to refer to the energy that light has. High frequency means high energy. Ultraviolet light, kind that comes from the sun, it can give you skin cancer. It's high frequency, it's high energy. Radio frequency light, the kind we look at here at the VLA, is low frequency. It's low energy. In fact, it is so low energy that if you were to add up all of the energy of the radio light collected by the VLA since it began taking data 40 years ago in 1980, it would amount to less than that of a snowflake hitting the ground. I'm not making that up. I've done the math. It is absolutely true. So low energy. But contains a wealth of information. And for thousands of years, humans only had access to a narrow range of the full spectrum of energies that light can have. You know, we look only at visible light, Roy G. Biv, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet with our puny human eyeballs. If you make the analogy between sound waves and electromagnetic light waves, um, you know, the, the, the range of frequencies um, on a standard piano keyboard in a single octave is, is comparable to the range of frequencies that are visible to the human eye, visible light. Um, and so, so the light that we can see with our eyes, if that takes up one octave on a piano keyboard, the entire spectrum of energies, of frequencies that light can have would fill more than 50 octaves on the piano keyboard. So just to give you an idea of how limited our vision is, um, in the scheme of you know what what is exists to be discovered and what is emitting light in the universe um, and it wasn't until the early 20th century that the first radio astronomers began to understand this huge window onto the universe previously beyond our vision so that's what the national radio astronomy observatory or nrao was established in 1956 to do was to open our eyes to the lowest frequencies the lowest energies of light that we couldn't see without radio telescopes So the NRAO consists of three radio observatories. Obviously, one of them is our beloved VLA. Happy birthday, VLA. Our Southern Hemisphere sister observatory is called the Atacama Large Millimeter Array, or ALMA. It's not ALMA. Go back. It'll catch up with me. Made up of 66 radio dishes located in the high desert of Chile, ALMA picks up where the VLA leaves off, both in its coverage of the southern sky and in frequency coverage. While the VLA can observe light with frequencies of about 1 to 50 gigahertz, ALMA can observe radio light from 85 gigahertz to almost 1,000 gigahertz. Now, the third observatory that comprises the National Radio Astronomy Observatory is the Very Long Baseline Array, or VLBA. 10 VLA-sized dishes that span the North American continent from Hawaii to St. Croix and the Virgin Islands. And there is a lag with this presentation. There we go, that's the very long baseline array. Hawaii to St. Croix and the Virgin Islands. New Mexico is the only state to host two of them. We've got one in Pie Town, just west of the VLA, and another one up north uh, in Los Alamos. 
but let's give the VLA the attention it deserves on its birthday. So why are we here? Why build one of the world's premier telescopes in the middle of the desert? Well, the plains of San Augustine were specifically chosen as the site of the VLA for a few reasons. Population density here is relatively low, which means fewer sources of radio frequency interference, which are unwanted radio waves from terrestrial sources like cell towers, Bluetooth and radar, or from other technology like satellites. And we're shielded by the surrounding mountains. Now, of course, we still have to contend with the, the radio world that we live in. You know, there's cell tower on the hills that's uh, just uh, above Magdalena. And people drive by on Route 60 with Bluetooth turned on in their cars. But there are far fewer sources of interference uh, out on the plains of San Augustine than if we were to build our array near a city like, say, Albuquerque. Um, also, the plains here are relatively flat. We are, after all, situated in a prehistoric lake bed, which makes it really easy to move your radio dishes to different locations, which is exactly what we do here. Now, while this wasn't a consideration when the VLA was first built, it's also a relatively arid environment, and the lack of moisture in the atmosphere is great for high-frequency observations, where water molecules can actually change the path that light takes on its way to our telescopes. Now, the VLA wasn't originally designed to go up to these frequencies, but it turned out to be a great thing that we are in a dry climate here um, for those higher frequency observations. Now, the VLA began construction in 1972 and was completed uh, and began taking data in October of 1980. Yes, the VLA turns 40 years old this month. <laughs> In the early 2000s, the VLA was in desperate need of an upgrade. In 2001, we received money from the National Science Foundation to upgrade the VLA to what we now call the expanded VLA or EVLA. The waveguides that carry the signal from the antennas to our correlating supercomputer were replaced with fiber optics and the correlator itself was upgraded. Uh, this expanded the computing power, expanded the bandwidth that we were capable of processing at, at a given time. And this was completed in 2012 and the telescope was rededicated for one of the founders of radio astronomy, Carl G. Jansky. Now, Dave Finley gave a much more detailed history of the VLA and its contributions to radio astronomy this morning, and that talk will be available on our Vimeo page in the next uh, couple weeks. And now, astronomers at NRIO are looking forward to what's next for the VLA, and we are very excited about the prospect of a next-generation VLA, or NGVLA. It's a proposed instrument for which we received research and development funding from the National Science Foundation that has the potential to revolutionize the field of radio astronomy. This instrument would be comprised of over 200 stationary 18 meter dishes spread across the state of New Mexico and potentially into Arizona, Texas, and Mexico. It would almost double our frequency coverage and offer greater sensitivity to faint astronomical sources than any other radio telescope on the planet. Suffice to say, we're very excited, and we will find out if the project will be funded sometime next year. If it is funded, construction would begin around 2025 and be completed in 2034. And if you want to learn more about the next big thing in radio astronomy, you should check out the recording of Rob Salina's talk from earlier in the day, which will also be available online if you missed it. Now the VLA is made up of 28 radio dishes that are 25 meters across and weigh over 200 tons each. These dishes are laid out in a Y configuration at discrete locations along over 80 miles of railroad track, which allows us to move the dishes to different locations. Now, there are four main configurations that the dishes can be placed into. In the D configuration, the dishes are darn close together. On presentation, there we go. D for darn close together. In this configuration, the furthest dish is only about a mile from the center of the array. And the next widest configuration is C, then B, and then A, where the dishes are A, long way away. In A configuration, the east and west arms are 13 miles long and the north arm is 11 miles long. Why are they different sizes? Well, there's a ravine at the top of the north arm that was too difficult to build over, so that's where it stops. And right now, we are in the B configuration. For the next five years, we will have a special fifth configuration, which is a hybrid of the B and A configurations, and which we will move into at the end of this month. We call it B North A. The east and west arms are in the B configuration, while the north arm is in the A configuration, which gives us increased sensitivity toward the galactic plane, 
on the southern horizon for a special project called the VLA Sky Survey, or VLAS. This is a project to map the entire radio sky visible to the VLA at frequencies from two to three gigahertz in order to provide the astronomy community with a catalog of radio sources and of the sky across the light spectrum. Now, if you visit the VLAS website, uh, which is right here, you can also post that in the chat. If you visit the VLAS website, you can view the regions of the sky that they've mapped so far. Now, Amy Kimball gave a great talk about VLAS earlier, and that'll be online as well if you want to know more. Now, before we added this hybrid configuration, we would normally change between configurations every four months so that each configuration would fall on a different part of the year every year, giving VLA users access to the greatest variety of targets. Now, depending on weather conditions, the current configuration, changing between configurations can take anywhere from a few days to a few weeks. In order to change between configurations, we have two big red diesel engines which have hydraulics to lift the antennas and move them at a blistering two miles per hour to carry them to their new location. They have to move slowly because the antennae are not bolted down during the move and the dishes can act as sails if wind speeds get too high. And we don't want to find our antenna tumbling across Route 60. So here's project scientist for the EVLA, Rick Purley, to explain a little bit more about the transporters. So now we're gonna go up into the end. So every four months, the array is reconfigured, which means that which uh, uh, transporters are used to pick up some of the antennas and move them to different pads. This is one of our two transporters. It's a unique machine. It uh, comprises four trucks of six wheels each. I'll explain in a moment how we actually turn corners with this. The basic idea of this, of this machine is pretty straightforward. You see the flat deck on there. The uh, transporter moves down the rails, slides underneath the antenna. Uh, the antenna is then unbolted from the uh, three concrete piers on which it normally sits. The transporter is raised up on hydraulic jacks, lifting the antenna up about six inches, enough to clear the bolts, and the transporter then backs up and takes the antenna to the main line. Now, the way the antenna transporter turns a corner is quite unusual for a rail vehicle. The engineers invented this right-angled turning system, uh, which uh, works in the following way. The transporter moves over the main line, and this is the main line heading down uh, say towards the center of the array. It's a double track. The transporter uh, trucks are each over the four intersections of the two uh, double tracks. A hydraulic jack lifts up one side of the transporter three or four inches, just enough to clear the flanges of the, six, of the 12 wheels on one side. The two trucks of six wheels each on that one side are then rotated by 90 degrees and put back down again the other side uh, of the transporter is then raised two or three inches. The other two trucks are rotated 90 degrees uh, and the whole assembly uh, rolls off in a 90 degree uh, different direction. So the Rick, are you there Rick? Nope, it's back to you. Oh, was that was it was that the end of Rick? Yeah, it's back. It's back to you. Yep. Okay. Yeah, it was just part of that video. I can't go back. I want to go back. All right, great. Thanks. During a change in configuration, we are still observing. We have a rule which we call the three antenna rule, which means we can have as many as three antennae not doing science and still get the quality of data necessary to satisfy our astronomers. Now, the reason we change configurations is because it allows us to change our sensitivity to scale. It may seem counterintuitive, 
but in the D configuration, we have the lowest resolution and are sensitive to the most diffuse structures, like the woofily lobes of a jet from an active galaxy. And in the A configuration, we have the highest resolution and are sensitive to the supermassive black hole at the center of such a galaxy or the circumstellar disk of gas and dust in an infant solar system. And here at the VLA and at ALMA and the VLA, we are using a combination of smaller discrete dishes to synthesize a telescope bigger than one we could physically engineer. The way that we do that is by combining the data from the individual antennae using our correlating supercomputer. It's a supercomputer in the sense that it can do one thing very, very quickly, and that's multiplication. Can't play Fortnite, but it can do a trillion multiplications per second. And the way that it does this is by multiplying the signal from antenna one by the signal from antenna two, and the signal from antenna one by the signal from antenna three, four, five, six, all the way up to 27, and the signal from antenna two by the signal from antenna three, and four, five, six, all the way, you get it, so on and so forth. And that gives us 351 pairs of antennae that we call baselines. These baselines are what allow us to reconstruct an image of the sky as if we had a single 20 meter, uh, excuse me, 20 mile diameter telescope. Now, each VLA dish contains eight receivers at the vertex, which cover the frequency range from one to 50 gigahertz, and two feed systems just below the prime focus on the apex of the antenna, which cover the really low frequencies from 58 megahertz to 470 megahertz. Now, each of the receivers at the uh, apex of the antenna has a feed horn to go along with it. And uh, I meant to show this on the earlier tour, but I forgot to. I have a VLA feed horn here with me. Um, Dan Mertley, if you're watching, I promise I'm still using this for something. Actually, I'm not just holding on to it as a cool paperweight. Um, but this is really what we mean when we say antenna, when we talk about the VLA. Um, the dish is not so much of an antenna as this is really an antenna. And perhaps if I hold it close enough, you can see down here at the very bottom of this, there is a little needle, and that is really the antenna. This is what couples the electromagnetic radiation that we are receiving from space <clears throat> to an actual transmission line, to an actual uh, uh, current in a waveguide or, uh, or in a fiber optic cable. Um, and these have to be designed very carefully because you don't want to be collecting radiation from unintended directions um, that can increase your sensitivity to RFI. Um, but, but those are a very vital component of the uh, observing system. And here is Rick Curley to tell us a little bit more about uh, the VLA receivers. Now we're going to go up into the antenna surface. It's, I've done that so many times, it's second nature. So in a cone to go. Nothing more that needs to be done for safety. And up we go. I've done that so many times, it's second nature. So this is a 25 meter paraboloid, and the paraboloid works the same way for all. Radiation comes in from the direction of the antenna is pointing, strikes the surface. In this case, it runs up to that subreflector, that conical shaped uh, asymmetric subreflector. And from there, the radiation is, is down in a cone to go in one of the eight feeds. We change our frequency by rotating the subreflector. So these feeds are not on the optical axis of the antenna, but they're arranged around a ring called the feed ring. And we can illuminate any one of them at a time. So that's the reason why we normally can observe only in one wave band or one receiver band at a time. So the eight horns that you can see there, you can see they're all different sizes. The larger the size, the longer the wavelength. So the big one is what we call L band, one to two gigahertz. That's 30 to 15 centimeters radiation, which goes into that horn by appropriate rotation of that subreflector. If we're interested in two to four gigahertz radiation, then the subreflector is rotated by 180 degrees and the radiation goes down that second largest feed horn called S-band. And so on and so forth with the other six receiver bands 
by our appropriate rotation of the subreflector, the radiation from the direction we're interested in will go down through the, through the horn and into the receivers. Each of these horns is covered with this white window material. This is for weather purposes. We don't, it's not necessary for the function of the horn. This is to keep rain and snow and dew, bird droppings and everything else out of these horns. There's a little bit of loss associated with that, uh, but that's just something you have, to, you have to accept. The funny inverted shape objects that are above the smaller horns are all heat lamps. We don't want dew or frost forming on the surfaces, especially at the higher frequencies or the shorter wavelengths. So when the dew point and the temperature are close together and sufficiently low for, for us to determine that dew is forming, the computer recognizes these combination of conditions, turns on these heat lamps, which warms up the surface and prevents frost and dew from, from uh, condensing on top of these weather windows. Thank you, Rick. Um, yeah, somebody said in the chat that they couldn't see the antenna when I was holding it up. Maybe that's because we're in presentation mode and my, uh, my actual video panel is small. So I'll show it again in the Q&A uh, session. Um, All righty. So you might be wondering who can use this incredible telescope. So if you don't mind, take a moment to fill out uh, a quick poll on who it is you think can use the VLA. Have the results of the poll. No. So, do you think that you are eligible to observe with the VLA? If you want to, the yeses are correct. You can. No joke. This is a taxpayer-funded observatory, which means that anybody with any background in any country in the world can use the VLA. You just have to write a proposal. There's always a catch. You have to write a proposal where you demonstrate that you understand the capabilities of this instrument and the science that you want to do with the VLA, uh, and that the science that you want to do has the potential to benefit the scientific community and advance our understanding of the universe. A panel of NRAO scientists review all of the proposals, I think it's twice a year for the VLA and once a year for the VLBA, and award telescope time based on the merit of the proposals. And we've awarded high school students observing time with the VLA, and every summer we have undergraduate college student interns. We're given director's discretionary time on both the VLA and VLBA. So you do not have to be a 10 year investor in order to use it. And we typically oversubscribe the telescope because we don't want any downtime. So we'll, we'll award around four times the amount of telescope time that we actually have available. Our proposals are given a ranking where a priority is the highest and means we'll try as hard as we can to run your observation. And the lowest C is basically filler time if the conditions are too poor for a high priority or if there's gaps in the schedule. So if you are awarded time on the VLA, you'll then work with one of our data analysts to write a script, which is a set of computer instructions that automatically tells the dishes how to move and when and where. Then our script goes into queue and our schedulers and algorithms arrange the observation based on the time of day, year, which targets are above the horizon, 
uh, and by the configuration that we're currently in and by weather considerations like wind speed. This is called dynamic scheduling as opposed to fixed scheduling, which we did for roughly the first 30 years of VLA operation where your observation is scheduled for a specific day at a specific time, and if something goes wrong, you're out of luck. But ultimately, the operators make the final decision on which observations get run, and you'll get a chance to ask Sylvia one of our operators questions in a few minutes. So once your data is taken, within minutes, it's sent to our offices in Socorro. where it's checked by our data analysts who are our last line of defense to ensure the data is of the highest quality before it gets sent to the astronomers who proposed for it. And once it's sent to the astronomers, they own those data, it's proprietary for one year, and those astronomers can do their analysis and write their journal papers without anyone else seeing, but after that one year, that data goes into a public archive, and it's fair game for anyone who wants to use it. So all of the data ever collected by the VLA that's older than one year is publicly available on our website. So even if you weren't awarded time on the VLA, you can still look in the archives and see if someone in the past observed what you're interested in and maybe they missed something. That's one of the great benefits of publicly funded science. So before we start the operator Q&A, uh, let's take a few minutes to answer some questions um, that you might have from this past presentation. Thanks, Tyler. And um, so one question that we have, and this is definitely one that we get a lot is, um, so the introduction, this person's introduction to the VLA was from watching Contact. And so is there anything during the film, like during the scenes at the VLA that the staff would like to set the record straight on? And the answer is definitely yes. So two uh, big misconceptions that that movie can uh, give you. It's a great movie, but um, for one thing, we don't uh, directly use VLA data here at NRAO for the purpose of SETI research. So we do have an arrangement with um, SETI where they can take data that our antennas receive and use that for their own research. But at the VLA specifically, we are not conducting SETI research. So. Um, our antennas are really good for zooming in on a particular object out in space and taking a really good look at it. When it comes to uh, searching for extraterrestrial life, we don't know where we're going to find that. So to do uh, those kinds of searches, we would want to, uh, telescopes that primarily just scan the sky most of the time, just pointing at lots of different things. Whereas when we use the VLA, the places that we point it we are, have a specific reason for looking at that object. And then uh, the other major misconception that that gives you is there's the very famous scene where Jodie Foster is wearing those big uh, headphones over her ears because she's listening to the data that they're receiving from space. So we don't listen to the VLA data that we receive, we look at it. In theory, we could listen to it, but in practice, we don't because that's not really the most efficient way to understand the information we're receiving. So we these dishes receive a uh, radio light from space and that's a type of light that our eyes are not able to see as mentioned earlier and so we instead convert that light into pictures using colors that our eyes are able to see. And so in the same way that the radio in your car converts radio light that it receives from a station into sound, we could do the same thing. But again, we're going to have a much better understanding of the data that we're getting from space if we look at it in the form of pictures as opposed to trying to listen to it. Okay, so... Um... Henry, uh, I, I got a good one. Henry Paul Kowalski, any relation to Sylvia, asks, uh, again, did I see a J-pole antenna above the dish? What is its purpose? Um, that's a great question and an excellent eye, Henry. Uh, yes, so there are eight receivers um, at the vertex of the antennas, but we also have two feed systems uh, just below the prime focus um, underneath the uh, apex of the antennas where the fork arms meet. Um, 
we have our low frequency feed systems up there. Um, so I said before the VLA goes from one to 50 gigahertz, but actually we can go a little bit lower than that. We can go down to uh, about 50 megahertz. Um, and so that's what, there's actually two feed systems there. There's that edge fed, uh, an end fed J pole feed system, which kind of goes around the, the corners of the fork arms. Um, and there's also just below the uh, secondary reflector, uh, which is underneath fork arms, there is a, uh, a center fed dipole there as well. And so those are the two, uh, those are the two feed systems that, um, that we use to observe from uh, 50 to about 450 megahertz. And then another good question that we have where I'm going to save part of it um, until when we get into our operator Q&A, but to start on it now, so it's what kind of background do you need to understand how the VLA works? And that honestly depends on um, like what you're doing at the VLA as an employee, because we have people who work in all sorts of different areas. We have our cryogenics experts who like worry about the stuff that we put inside the antennas to keep the receivers cool. We have our electronics experts. We have the mechanics who uh, service the antennas and care, move, we have the track crew who moves the antennas up and down these railways, railways into the different configurations. We of course have the astronomers who do research. We have uh, the education folks like us and we need to, we don't have to have necessarily huge in-depth uh, ideas of a lot of things, but we need to have a general idea of many different aspects of the VLA. And then when we get into our Q&A session with, our, with Sylvia, then she can tell you the kinds of things that an operator needs to know. Okay. This is so, kind of in line with, with uh, oh, uh, there's just another similar question that Andrew asked, uh, which is what types and levels of mathematics does an operator or astronomer at the VLA use on a regular basis? Um, and I can answer this a little bit for myself, but I'm sure Sylvia can answer this uh, as well. And it might be a different set of math skills. Um, I tend to use a lot of linear algebra, definitely a lot of statistics, really. Uh, if you're doing any kind of astronomy, you have to have a very, very, um, very strong command of uh, statistics concepts because that's what allows you to understand. I mean, the, the fundamentals of radio astronomy are based on um, principles in statistics, um, you know, things about probability distributions and and central limit theorem and things like that are fundamental to the, the fact that radio astronomy even works at all. Um, so maybe, maybe Sylvia has uh, some, some different answers to that, but I would say, at least for myself, certainly linear algebra and statistics. Okay, so with, um, yeah, with, I think with the rest of the questions we have, we can um, continue those into the operator Q&A. So, now we are going to welcome our operator on duty, Sylvia Kowalski. So the operators out at the site do a lot of different things. And also Sylvia, you're welcome to come on camera and say hi whenever you're ready to, so. Great, thank you so much, Faith. <laughs> I forgot that we were using that picture of me wearing antenna hat. I really like it. <laughs> Um, hello world, thank you so much for coming to celebrate the uh, 40th birthday of the VLA. Okay, go ahead, Faith. Yeah, so what, um, the operators, uh, as you can see here, they have a lot of different computers they have to monitor. Actually, I have um, another video I can show you that uh, shows the control room. So bear with me just a second here. Luckily, the videos have been working better. Yay. Very large array is controlled from here in this room on the top floor of the back of the control building. As a radio telescope, the VLA works night and day. The array averages 5,000 hours of observing every year with maintenance and reconfiguration scheduled in between. All activities are directed, controlled, and monitored by staff in this control room. All right, so now back to our presentation here. 
Yeah, so among so the the operators are pretty much the VIPs when it comes to being on site because they kind of act as the site managers in a lot of different ways. So during our weekdays, we frequently have our antenna crews going out onto the antennas to perform maintenance on them. And when they're doing that, they have to coordinate with the operators before, during, and after that process. And they also look out for the safety of everybody on site. So if there's, for example, wildlife in places where it shouldn't be, they would call the proper person on site depending on the time of day to have them come and relocate that wildlife to somewhere safer. <laughs> if there's um, a thunder lightning storm going on, then they'll let everyone know to please come inside for their own safety. If we're going to have a tour group uh, on our site, obviously during non-COVID times, we let the operators know about that. And um, we have security on site um, every day. And so the guards also, coordinate with the operators as well. So they are very important people. And so we have somebody on site 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 363 days a year, or since this is a leap year, 364 days, all of the operators get Thanksgiving and Christmas off. So, right. But then <laughs> we do have somebody present um, at all times. So the day out at the site is split into three different eight hour shifts. There's the day shift of 8 a.m. to 4 p.m., the evening shift of 4 p.m. to midnight, and the graveyard shift of midnight to 8 a.m. And <laughs> operators actually start their day here at our office building in Socorro, and then they drive an hour out to the VLA site, work there for, eight hours or a little bit more, and then they spend another hour driving back. So they work 10 hour days, which also means that they only have to work four days a week. So they get more days off. So I've gathered that they definitely <laughs> work off. And, <laughs> and they generally cycle with who does what shifts, except for there's one fine gentleman out there who always does midnight shifts. Yes, <laughs> thank you, Sam. <laughs> All right, so Sylvia, do you want to tell us a little bit about your background? Yes, yes, of course. Um, I would love to. Um, also, Faith, I feel like every time I hear your spiel about my job, I like re-remember re something else that I do. <laughs> so thank you. Um, but yeah, so my background, I grew up in Seattle, Washington, uh, a lot uh, cooler and a lot cloudier than New Mexico. Um, and I was first um, intrigued by astronomy from actually a high school course um, in astronomy. That inspired me to pursue um, uh, a bachelor's degree at the University of Washington in astronomy and also physics. So I have a BS in astronomy and physics. Um, but I was and still am a theater nerd. So I also have a bachelor of arts degree in drama. Um, and during my time at the University of Washington, I learned that while I loved um, using astronomical data um, to make discoveries, I really, really liked working with the telescopes and the instruments themselves even more. Um, so that's what I decided I wanted my path to explore more the instrumentation and the ingenuity that it takes um, for astronomers to collect this light from space, which really is like one of the only tools that we have to learn about the cosmos. Um, but at the same time, I also discovered while working at a science museum in Seattle, uh, the Pacific Science Center, that I really love science education and outreach. Um, so those have kind of been the two paths that I've been pursuing um, since I graduated. Um, I have worked at the VLA for about two and a half years now. Um, I, my official job title is Operations Specialist 2, <laughs> um, but we typically just call ourselves um, telescope operators. Um, like Faith said, our job is really, sometimes really all over the place. Um, it's really very varied. Um, so when we come into work, not only are we rotating between these shifts that can be very different, we really have no idea what's going to happen 
on any given day. And I love that because I love it when my day is really exciting. Um, it could be maybe it's a midnight shift and all of the observations that I pick to run with the current weather conditions run perfectly. And I just get to enjoy being a part of this amazing scientific process of learning about the cosmos or maybe it's a maintenance day and there's 50 million people calling me on the phone and the radio and I need to fix things on the telescope with my software and it's simply bananas. <laughs> so um, it really takes to be an operator. I would say we're looking for people who both have an excitement about a technical engineering instrumentation side, but are also really um, comfortable with dealing with a lot of people, managing situations that are maybe high stress, really time sensitive. Um, so that's kind of the skills uh, that we look for in candidates for uh, telescope operators. Awesome, thank you. So now yeah. we are going to move into our uh, Q&A with Sylvia. And so um, one of the questions from earlier was, so what kind of um, things do you need to know, like background do you need to have specifically for your job? And then there's also a pretty similar question, just like it can be educational and job background, like special skill sets, just that general thing. Yeah, those are really good questions. So um, for an operator, a lot of what we're doing, we're monitoring maybe not during like a maintenance day when we're doing a lot of people management, but uh, maybe it's a shift where we're entirely running science observations for astronomers from around the world. Um, a lot of what we're doing during that type of shift is that we're just, we're monitoring all of the antennas and their subsystems. Um, in order to do that correctly, we one, we have to know, have a pretty um, in-depth knowledge of how each of the subsystems of the antenna works so that we can notice if something is going wrong, how it's going wrong, and maybe a potential solution for it. Um, and then we have a toolbox, you know, uh, not a physical toolbox, but an intellectual toolbox um, to solve a portion of these problems. But of course, it's a, if it's a really large problem that arises during a shift, we will probably be calling someone and waking them up at 3 a.m. <laughs> to help us um, try and figure out, you know, what's going on. Um, but I would say that's one of the main things is understanding the electronics and the hardware of this system. Um, like Tyler said, a, a lot of the theory that goes into making radio astronomy work is statistic. So we're using um, a fair amount of basic statistics. Um, and then when we are um, monitoring a lot of this data, we're looking at numbers and we're also looking at graphs. So the ability to read a graph that's expressed in different types of units and understanding enough of the physics and astronomy that's happening to really um, be able to take, you know, this data that we're seeing and kind of understand what could be going right or wrong during that time. Um, like I said, I have a, a bachelors of science in physics and astronomy. Um, we have a fair amount of operators that also have bachelor's degrees in physics or math um, or astronomy. Uh, we also have some folks who have a background in electronics and engineering. Um, so that's kind of the, the background that we're looking for. Um, and I think there was a, oh, the follow-up question about maybe just some other skills that are important. Um, like I said, our job can sometimes be really chaotic. So having a personality where you're pretty comfortable with things getting really wild and um, staying calm even during chaos, I think is a really important uh, quality. Um, and then also maybe one more thing <laughs> um, is that I think you have to be really passionate about um, what we're doing because there's a lot of things that are strange about our job. You know, we're working all hours of the day. You never know what your day is going to be like. Um, there's a lot of driving involved. Um, so I think a passion for the science and this quest to learn about the universe, I think is really important. And all of our operators have that to such an incredible degree. So it's just an awesome team to work for. Yeah. And then someone asks, is Sylvia both operating the VLA and talking to us right now? Oh. <laughs> this is an advantage of the virtual format because if we Great were in question. person, the answer would be yes. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> and, and if 
um, and like Faith said, if it was a public tour, I would be talking to you, but every like five minutes, I'd be like, okay, let me just check all my stuff. Okay, hello, <laughs> let me just check. <laughs> so um, it is really, I will say, really nice. I am not the operator on duty right now. Um, it is 421 New Mexico time. So right now we have an afternoon operator is working. I don't know who's operating right now. Hannah was the day shift operator, I think. Whoever is operating the VLA right now, thank you so much. <laughs> um, but no, I'm right now, I'm sitting in an office in our Socorro um, office building right now. Great. And okay, so what would, this is also kind of on a similar note, but what would be the next career steps for someone who's an operator? Like you're an operator now mm. in the future, what kind of careers might you move on to? That is a really good question. Um, it really depends on the person. We have had, <clears throat> excuse me, telescope operators who absolutely love everything that goes into being an operator. And they've worked at the VLA as an operator for over 15, 20 years. Um, there's some people that realize the rotating work shifts and some of the up-down stress, how it's so, so varied is not really their jam, but they're really still interested in working maybe with data um, that comes from the VLA. So we've had people who work for a while as an operator and then maybe shift into a position um, as maybe a data analyst or a scheduler, such as um, uh, Melissa is a data analyst. So working with the data after it's come through the telescopes. Um, I think one benefit of being an operator at any telescope is that you really have a pretty intimate understanding of the instrument. So if you want to move around within the observatory, you you are coming in with a pretty substantial um, body of knowledge about how this instrument works. So um, again, it's really up to the operator. Nice. And then related to that, how many years do operators typically stay at the VLA? I'm assuming that, that probably really, varies too. <laughs> it, Definitely varies. So the way we'll say we we tend to see it's kind of bimodal. We see people who stay like one to two years, and then people who stay like five to twenty years. <laughs> so it's, you you try it out and you either love it or you try it out and you say that was awesome, but I need something else. <laughs> um, so it's really varied. Um, yeah, again, like like I said, I've I've been working here for about two and a half years, and it's absolutely awesome. Um, we have a couple of operators who've been with us maybe about a year now, and then some more than ten years. Right. Yeah. And then examples of chaos up on the hill during your shift. This is kind of a two-parter. So that's the first one. Like, what's to, so? What are some chaotic things that happen during your shift? That's a really good question. So I'd say probably the the most chaotic and things that maybe happen most often are any instances with power. So, you know, if you're in your house and there's like a little power glitch and the lights flicker, but everything comes back on. Um, if you're at the VLA and there's a power glitch like that, a lot of our subsystems, if there is a power glitch where they get turned off and then back on again, they're no longer synchronized with this very, very exact timing that we have to keep. So it can wreak a ton of havoc, even just a little glitch. Um, so things related to power are probably the biggest. Um, <laughs> I've kind of been trained emotionally, even if I'm just in my house and the lights flicker, I get a rush of adrenaline and inside my head I'm thinking, okay, what do I need to fix? <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's probably the biggest. Um, and then of course, anything that's related to like an emergency situation, um, as we are, the control room is the only room that has someone in 24 seven. Um, we are in charge of managing both routine situations at the VLA, but also emergency situations, um, like Faith and Tyler said. So anytime we're dealing with you know, the health and safety of a person, um, the health and safety of a, a hardware component or antenna, that's really stressful. Um, and that can be really difficult. Um, and then sometimes just really, you know, bizarre things. We had, um, Faith reminded me earlier today, there was a day that was really windy. We had some gusts that were up to about 60 miles per hour. And one of the panels that's covering that main dish came off of the antenna and that's not something that we'd ever seen before so every single day at the VLA or night there's going to be something new that happens um, 
Yeah, yeah it was a and I, I it was so bananas. And the picture kind of looked like the antenna had lost a tooth. <laughs> it was, yeah, it was super, super goofy. So yeah, I think those are probably the emergency situations and power are definitely like the wildest. And then um, as like the second part of that question, do you get full 30 minute lunch breaks and 15 minute coffee breaks? Oh, that is such a good question. Um, not in the sense where you're like, oh, it's been four hours. I'm going to go take a lunch. Um, we take our breaks and we rest our mind when the VLA is calm. <laughs> so if VLA is not having a good day and there's a lot happening, uh, your day is not very restful. Um, but if these are calm, that's great. And you can leisurely enjoy your lunch while sitting in front of all of your monitors in the control room. Um, we, we try to ensure that the uh, longest break, so the long amount of time that an operator is away from the control room is four minutes and 59 seconds. So if you gotta go fill up your coffee cup or go to the bathroom, just make sure it's pretty speedy um, and take your you know, allotted breaks when things are calm. <laughs> Great question. Yeah, makes sense. And then uh, what's the data rate for uh, the scanning functions? Do you know? Oh, I was, that's such a good question. And I will admit, we look at that and right now I cannot remember the number. <laughs> um, but I will say it really does change depending on the observation. So kind of related to that, uh, one of the components that's going to go into you know, the, the um, data rate and how much data we're storing for each observation is going to be the length of the observation. And that can vary tremendously. So if, let's say Faith, you were awarded 20 hours of VLA observing time. Congratulations. <laughs> you can work with the data analyst to create a script that is either 20 hours long, or you could chunk it up into different amounts of time depending on the science um, that you're doing. Typically, we will observe what are called scheduling blocks, which are either components of an observation or the entirety of an observation. And they typically range from about one to like three hours um, in time. So after that, you know, after that one observation was run, we have to make sure to have the next one queued up and ready to go because at most we want to have one second between the time that one observation ends and the next one begins. We have so much science to get to. We have to be very, very speedy with that. And then someone asked that they have uh, pictures of the control room that we work in. So that's mainly the, the pictures that we have here. So I'll go back a, a couple of slides. So this basically is the control room. This is Sylvia in her natural habitat at work. <laughs> and, yes, I feel at home. <laughs> And then um, from the video too, that was basically, so this, what you're seeing here in these pictures is um, the control room out at the site. Yeah. And then um, a question, we're getting a lot of questions from uh, people named Kowalski today. So <laughs> um, what kind that of- That is effect, definitely my dad. Hi dad. <laughs> what kind of effect does space junk have on your work? Oh. That's a really good question. Space junk. Well, I would say, at least as an operator, we're more interested in the stuff that humans put up in space that are working. So like, as we've been saying, um, satellites, things that are broadcasting radio light down to earth for all of the things that we need it for, you know, radio stations and entertainment and, and Wi-Fi and cell phone service. Um, those are really you know, those are the buggers because they're blaring this really bright radio light and we're trying to see through that and see the really, really dim sources of actual cosmic radio light. Um, so for the most part, the, the things that humans make that are still working, that's going to be the big problem. Um, other kind of junk and stuff floating in space, um, maybe an astronomer wants to study that. That's a great question. Mm -hmm. And then um, I think we have time for one more. So is there anyone who's been there since the beginning? And <gasps> that is a great question. Yes, yes. We have quite a few amazing people who have been with us since the beginning. Um, I feel like we should also give them some sort of 
mega award today for helping BLA get to 40 years, which again, I just, I'm amazed that an instrument, you know, because technology is evolving, but we've figured out ways to upgrade our instrument as technology evolves. So I think that's just, you know, a testament to these people who have been here for 40 plus years. They're part of the reason we are able to even celebrate today. Yeah, and it is 40 plus because they didn't just come here right when the VLA was dedicated in 1980. We had to start, we started building it in the 70s. So in terms of how long they would have been here, that's longer than 40 years. And for some of them, their various yeah. jobs have, have changed, but it's mm -hmm. it definitely is like, meanwhile, I've just been here three years. So <laughs> great to hear right. all sorts of really cool, interesting stories from people who have been here uh, for uh, e either the whole time or for a very long time, at least, and all the great stuff they have to say. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good point, Faith. Yeah, mm. one of them, actually, one of the people who's been here the whole time was Rick Purley, who was the guy in those uh, vid couple of videos that I showed you early on in the presentation. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, Faith, I just had one thing that's not really related to anything technical that I just, oh, yeah. I forgot to share in the first tour and I really wanted to. Um, I don't know if other telescope operators experience this, but I dream about the telescopes all the time. <laughs> <laughs> um, sometimes they're like super stress dreams where like I realize that an antenna has fallen over or or the control room has been completely reconfigured and I don't know where any of my monitors are and it's really stressful. Um, but sometimes the dreams are amazing. Like there was this one time <laughs> where I dreamt that I found a 29th antenna somewhere in the woods. <laughs> that is awesome. <laughs> it was so goofy. So uh, yes, the VLA is very powerful and it infiltrates my mind when I sleep. <laughs> I'd imagine, yeah, the stress dreams would be like kind of in the vein of the, oh my God, I forgot to do my homework sort of thing. Yes. yes <laughs> it's level of stress, but that's yeah. great that you dream about things like finding a 29th antenna too. I love that. <laughs> it was so goofy. And I think in my dream, I remember thinking, I hope I get a really big raise for this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If you found a 29th antenna, I think you would deserve one at that point. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Awesome. All right. Well, that we are. Um, that's the end of our presentation today. So everybody who wants to can come back on and say goodbye. But thank you so so much for being here today. And so if you want more VLA, we also on our website we have the webcam that you can look at that shows you live uh, footage from the VLA right now, and the VLA mission control which likewise shows you what uh, the VLA is currently observing. And uh, our next virtual tour is going to be in about a month on Saturday, November 7th, and that will be 1 to 2 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. And so thank you so much, everybody, for coming today. This has been a great uh, 40th birthday for the VLA, and have a good one, everyone. Right, well, thank you very much for that virtual tour, Summer, and your team. We're going to go over to some of the questions that we've had um, in the live feed here on Zoom, as well as on our Facebook pages. And thank you, there are some really good questions coming through. So Summer, Faith, the first question I have for either of you is from Pride, and she, she wants to know, what if you would like to get observations done on the VLA but you want to do it while you're still in your country, how would that be performed? Well, the good news is um, you don't have to be uh, at the VLA at all to take data with the VLA. Way back in the day, it did used to be that you did have to because the computers that were capable of processing VLA data were on site. But um, now that we've upgraded and improved the VLA, when an observation is complete on the 
the operator will send out an email to the people involved on the proposal. And that has a link that you can click on and download your data. So you could be on completely the other side of the world in your pajamas even working uh, with VLA data and um, it's accessible from anywhere, which is really nice. That's right. We have this incredible team called the Science Ready Data Products team who makes sure that, you know, that there's absolute integrity um, and that they've done much of the crunch work before you get your data. So from Camille, Camille, thanks for joining us again. He's been a regular attendee of these sessions. Mm -hmm. He wants to know, how do you calibrate each of the dishes in the array? And how do you calibrate all of them combined to a single point of focus? Ah, that's a good question. So um, I think there's two things going on there. There's one thing is calibration and the other thing is the pointing um, accuracy. So each antenna has its own motor um, and Sylvia mentioned that she has these GUIs where she can look at the stats for each antenna, but she can put in the code that the um, astronomer has submitted to run the observations will have the pointing coordinates um, and so every antenna will eventually point there. Um, some of them some seem to make it faster and some are slower sometimes. Um, but one of the things that we do is that, you know, we can't ensure, we can ensure sort of a pointing accuracy within a certain bounds, but in order to account for um, little tiny errors, what is built into the observations is calibration sources. So what happens is we have several known radio sources where we really know their intrinsic brightness and we know them very well. So when the telescopes are observing the object of interest, um, they do that for a while and then they will turn and point at a calibrator source and observe that source and then go back to the normal observing run. And they do this throughout. So usually there's several calibrators that are all over the sky. So they go to the nearest one so they don't waste time slewing. And then in the data analysis process, the astronomer will uh, sort of process the data for the calibrators first. So it's kind of like you take into account what the atmosphere was doing, what telescopes were doing, what individual dishes might have been slightly off, and you know what the calibrator should look like, and you know how it looked during your observations. So there's a correction factor that then you apply to your real data and your real sources. Yeah. The next question comes from Loish. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, who's aged six and space obsessed apparently, who wants to know, but what happens if more than one antenna is broken because you only have one spare and how long do the antennas last? Well, the good news is we have out at the site what we call the three antenna rule. So um, we can actually, out of the 27 antennas that we're using on the array, so not counting the 28th spare one, we can have up to three of them that we're not using at any given time. Like maybe we have, since we have two transporters, maybe we're currently moving two of them. Maybe there's a third one that's just having a bad day and not running properly. But as long as we have at least 24 out of the 27 active ones up and running, we can still get enough data to keep our scientists happy. There are sometimes like if it's really windy or if we're just otherwise like having bad weather where it's not safe to use the antennas for one reason or another, we may just have to stop observing during that time if we have too many antennas that are down. And of course, having all 27 of them up and running is the best case scenario, but it does sometimes happen or often happen actually where we don't have all 27 of them up and that's still okay. Mm -hmm. And Faith, just a follow up question. Do the observations have to happen with all the dishes at once or can one do an, you know, an observation with say just six dishes at a time? Yeah, so we can uh, split the VLA up into subarrays, as they're called. Um, from what I've heard, they can can split them up into as many as five different subarrays, so have them looking at up to five different things. We pretty rarely do that. For about ninety to ninety-five percent of the time, all of the antennas will be working together, looking at one thing. The uh, mo one major example I can think of within the past few years when we split them up is when we had um, a partial solar eclipse. It was total in other parts of the country, but it was partial. At 
at the VLA in 2017. We had 26 antennas running that day and 13 of them were looking at one thing, I think directly at uh, the sun and doing solar observations. And then the other 13 were looking at a different object that was nearby the sun. Right. Can I add to that, Anya? Yeah, sure, of course. Yeah, so the other interesting thing that you can do with the subarrays is that it won't look like the antennas are doing anything different, but six of them can be observing in one frequency and then another 10 can be another frequency and then the remainder can be another frequency. So that also can be useful because sometimes scientists like to observe a source at multiple frequencies because it's going to tell them different things about the behavior of that source. Right, which is the cool thing about having those 10 receivers, yeah. right? And so to answer this last question about how long they last, all yeah. of the ones that are still there are the original ones. We just yeah. sort of have them rotate through our maintenance barn. So they get, um, you know, uh, checkups uh, every so often and we replace anything that's broken. But for the most part, they're just still lasting. They're great. That's antennas. right. And they've got to keep lasting until at least 2035 when we go online, hopefully with the NG VLA. So. Right, from Christian, how, does it, how long does a typical observation with the VLA take? Um, that can vary uh, a lot. So when, when people put in a, a proposal asking for time on the VLA, it could be that they're granted time, but not as much time as they actually asked for. That's one common way that we're able to get more, give time to more proposals is by shortening the amount of time that we give each one. So on average, it tends to be around four hours for one observation. It can go quite a bit longer. Longer. You could spend an entire day, like eight or so hours doing one. And there could even be um, proposals that are granted uh, days worth of time in total, in which case usually it'll, they'll observe for maybe eight of those hours one day, and then a few days later, come back to it and do eight more hours. It can also be shorter than four hours as well. There are quite a few uh, proposals that are granted an hour or two of time. And sometimes it's even as short as a half an hour, not too often, but occasionally. Right. Another question from Pride who wants to know what are the different types of software needed for the VLA? Oh, that is a good question. And um, since I'm not in the thick of the software, I probably don't have the most complete answer. Um, but I believe that on the operator side, there's sort of a mix of Java and Python. Um, I forget, Sylvia had a mashup name for it at some point, but um, a lot of it is those two. And then we have specific software that the astronomers and the data analysts are using, which is um, either the original software image processing software called APES or the uh, newer version of APES, which is called CASA. That's Did I get right. that right, Faith? Anything else? Yeah. Yeah, and of yeah. course, CASA, you know, is a product of the NRAO and is used for ELMA, it's used for, um, you know, VLA, and I think, you know, pretty, pretty much every radio telescope out there. I may be wrong with that, but, um, yeah. we're, you know, we're constantly updating, updating CASA as we go. Yeah, and APES was also created by NRAO, and the guy who created it, Eric Grayson, is still here. Yeah. <laughs> still working on it. Used to be a good place to work. <laughs> Yeah. Right. So from and, Camille. Oh, I was going to, sorry, I was going to add one more thing to that too. We also um, use a, a hybrid program of Java and uh, Python when it comes to, I've heard it's, I've heard it called Jython before. So yeah, that can also be used for, um, for running the, um, for controlling, writing the programs and as well. And uh, yeah, I think that's one that the operators tend to have yeah. experience I'm, with. I'm really surprised they haven't come up with an acronym for that. <laughs> okay, so from Camille, what measures do you use to reduce radio frequency interference? Lots of different things. Um, <laughs> one of the things on our side, actually our um, educator tour guide side is that we um, gently accost and strongly recommend every um, public visitor that we see to turn off all cell phone and Bluetooth devices. Um, we have a dedicated RFI engineer on site and he has these great graphs that actually you can really see the arrival of people on the site where the RFI starts to spike. Sometimes that includes the staff as well. 
Um, so he is always monitoring the RFI and then noticing um, either strange new sources or other things that we have to take into account. We also actually collaborate with a lot of other agencies, especially ones that are sending satellites over the VLA that are transmitting. Um, receiving satellites, not a problem, only if they're transmitting. And so we have some um, agreements with them that they will stop transmitting uh, over our site. Um, but one of the ones that doesn't stop transmitting is Sirius FM. So hilariously, a radio broadcast satellite is interfering with radio astronomy. And the uh, operators have a little chart of the spectrum of the Sirius FM satellites in the control room so that they can recognize if the data looks a little funky, if it's just that or if it's actually something else. Um, right. But it's, it's a constant problem and both the NSF and the greater radio astronomy community um, have regular meetings to try and work on both mitigating this and coming up with how to share the spectrum um, responsibly. Correct. And in fact, the NRAO has just been awarded the contract by the NSF to in fact um, do spectrum, you know, spectrum observations and, uh, you know, monitoring the spectrum and doing the management of that, especially, of course, with so many Starlink, um, SpaceX Starlink satellites going up, you know, that spectrum is really starting to get very busy. Um, and, we're, you know, we're also looking at, uh, for our visit, you know, for our guests, a citizen science project that can get them to help us monitor that spectrum and see what's going on out there. Right. So, yes. yes. I was a, a fun little tidbit is that we also do not have a microwave oven anywhere on site at the VLA because if we did and we use that, that would cause a ton of interference right there in terms of radio light, it would light the place up like the 4th of July. So we want to cook our food on site. We have other methods of doing so. Yeah. And it's uh, for the South African guests, of course, your, your South African Radio Astronomy Observatory um, has really you know, done incredible work in terms of radio frequency interference for the Meerkat telescope in the Northern Cape, um, including pre-testing items that go out to site. So you know, they will be able to know at what frequency your digital camera works. Um, you know, so that's another way of making sure that they can pull all that out of the data. So onto your discoveries, question from Pride and from Sharid, which I'm going to combine, is what are some of the best discoveries that have been made by the VLA? Um, and then, you know, Camille wants to know what are some of the biggest discoveries you are still hoping to make with the VLA? Ooh, that second one's a very good question. Um, as for some of the discoveries uh, in the past, um, one of my favorites is that the VLA helped discover ice on Mercury. Um, and you would think that the um, tiny little rocky planet closest to the sun would never have any temperatures cold enough to have ice. But it turns out that there's some craters at the poles that have a little bit of shadow that never sees sunlight. And so the VLA was instrumental in detecting the molecules of the water ice um, on Mercury. Um, another thing that's very cool uh, is gravitational lensing. You've seen probably some of the Hubble pictures. Um, there's even a famous one of a smiley face that some people think looks cute and other people think it makes the universe looks terrifying. <laughs> but there's little warped galaxies. So whenever you see these little blue warped things, they're actually distorted images of a galaxy behind a massive galaxy cluster. Um, and that's in visible optical light, but the same thing can happen in radio light. And there's a very specific alignment with those sources um, that can produce an Einstein ring. So it's almost like instead of multiple images, it's a perfect circle. That's a one galaxy distorted light. And the VLA discovered the first gravitational lens Einstein ring. And there's so many more things. Well, it's, um, I think, you, you know, the question to ask is probably, you know, what are we hoping to discover once we have the VLA and the NGVLA? Yeah. Um, and the NGVLA, you know, has five main science cases. And, you know, those range about everything from, you know, formation of, you know, um, well, formation and evolution of galaxies outside, of course, um, the Milky Way, you know, all the way to, my goodness, compact objects, you know, uh, gravity, um, you know, astrobiology, you know, discoveries as well. So, you know, the, and all that NGVLA information is available on the NGVLA pages. And, and another great thing to- VLA, oops, sorry. 
I was just going to say what I love about the VLA is the versatility because mm -hmm. it can observe everything from the sun and the solar system to quasars and some of the most distant objects in the solar system and then everything in between. So Perfect. it's a really powerful instrument. And then also there's just the fact that and when it comes to astronomy and learning about the universe, oftentimes we don't know what we don't know yet. So um, a lot of the things we have discovered, we were just looking at certain objects, not knowing what we were going to find or certainly not expecting to find some of the amazing things that we did. So some of the discoveries that we haven't made yet, we have no idea what we're going to discover about them or what their nature is going to turn out to be because we might just be looking at an object just for to learn more about it just for certain reasons and be like oh wow didn't expect to see that but we just learned a whole new thing about how these types of objects work so that's a really cool thing about astronomy in general really absolutely all right from camille um does ground stability for each dish play a very important role in the sensitivity of the array in general um, also how is the instrument geared to face the weather and its effects over time um that ground stability one kind of gets taken into account i think with the calibration that i was talking about earlier because each telescope each dish sorry each antenna um, sits on these three concrete piers and so every time that antenna and antenna is moved to a new peer set, then um, there's a lot of uh, like a protocol checklist um, for figuring out exactly where in space that antenna is now. Um, and then that can be also taken into account if it's slightly off any of them, if they're slightly off that comes out in the calibration. Um, the other question was weather and um, was that correct? Yeah. Yeah, essentially. Um, they all have lightning rods attached to them um, and they all have anemometers um, on either side of the dish. Um, so when the telescope is in its largest configuration, when the dishes are a long way away, a lot of times you can have weather conditions on one arm that are completely not on the other arm. So if it was up to the operator to monitor the weather um, at every location, they would kind of, um, have to generalize to some extent, or they would have to have like very good instrumentation. So the antennas can actually stow themselves if uh, winds reach over, I believe, um, 35 miles an hour, and it's a, for a sustained like six seconds. Um, so sometimes um, if you're driving by and you see them uh, up, they could either be having a bad day, like Faith likes to say, or they could have auto stowed themselves um, for weather or just for other technical issues. Um, and they have been struck by lightning, but um, the lightning rods really do their trick. And so they're all grounded and there's really not a lot of damage from lightning. Although fun fact, Bon Jovi album cover, um, I can't remember the name of the album, but the song is Every Day was filmed. The video for that song was filmed at the VLA. And during that shoot, there was a lightning storm. And so there's a picture that became the album cover for the Bon Jovi album of the lightning striking the plains of St. Augustine, not an actual antenna. That's brilliant. And I believe we were also on a poster for Dave Matthews Band at one stage. Right. And then so the antennas are also programmed to, if it's snowing hard enough, sometimes snow can start to pile up in the dishes if they're pointed too high up. So apparently the operators have a program called Dump where when they execute it, the dishes will just turn themselves over on the side to literally dump snow out of themselves and then just turn and keep pointing at, at whatever they're looking at. And the weather, um, like the and there's a lot of clouds and precipitation, we can still observe through that. We usually just have to go for lower frequencies, but uh, unless like Summer said, it's too windy, it doesn't usually stop us from observing. No, in fact, uh, I think Mark McKinnon, who's our project director out there once told me that because we have dishes out um, you know in the Virgin Islands and Hawaii they have to be able to withstand hurricane strength winds so right so um, on to our last question and I think some of maybe while I answer this if you could give a, a you know some thought to what you think the best question is um, but we had a question from I think it was Sharid as well who was saying well you know how how will the SKA and the VLA and the NGVLA work together will they work together um, and what are the differences? And of course, in the world of interferometry, which is where we connect you know, more than one dish together, there really are three main reasons why you know, um, the NGVLA and the SKA 
you know, with Meerkat are very, very important. And it's important that we have both sets of instruments. Um, the first is that, of course, up in the Northern Hemisphere, we can only see, I think, about 80% of the sky from where we are. And the same will happen with the Southern Hemisphere in that you will only be able to see, you know, if you're in the summer, some, um, Southern Hemisphere up to a certain point. So in order to be able to map the entire sky or do observations of the entire sky, it really is important to have data from you know, both sets of telescopes. The other main difference is, of course, that these instruments work um, you know, at different frequencies. So if you look at SKA mid, we're talking about 350 megahertz to about 15.3 gigahertz. That's, of course, the one, um, you know, the SKA mid will be in South Africa. SKA low is very low frequency. We're looking at 50 megahertz to about 350 megahertz. Um, whereas if you look at the NGVLA, um, you know, that's going to be very low. You know, it's got quite a big bandwidth in terms of, you know, the gigahertz. It's going to be 1.2 to 116. Um, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think uh, looking at the VLA, we're looking at one gigahertz to about 50 gigahertz. Yes. Um, so, you know, yep. so, you know, it's also at the different frequencies. So, of course, as Summer was saying, is we really want to be able to get as much data at the different frequencies as possible to be able to, you know, look at the different data and what, the, what that data tells us. Um, and the third thing is related to interferometry. Um, and that is really that the further apart your dishes are, of course, the better resolution you, you get, which really is one of the big drivers behind the SKA telescope. Um, but also something called uh, space geodesy, where we use something called very long baseline interferometry to be able to, you know, not only make sure your time is accurate, but also, um, you know, do positioning of things in outer space and on Earth. So at the moment, um, the VLBI, as we said, has got 10 dishes, but can you imagine if we had you know, um, and there is already an existing network, but imagine, you know, the more dishes we can add to that VLBI network, you know, the stronger that network will become. So um, it really is very important. Um, and, you know, in, uh, science diplomacy is a very big thing in the field of radio astronomy. It's one of the many careers you can go into, um, you know, really radio astronomy is a very, very wide field. Um, you can become a material specialist, you can become an astrophysicist, you can do outreach, you can do software development, you can do science diplomacy, observation, uh, observatory management, really there's an incredibly wide field of careers out there. So Summer, best can question also, to get uh, the swag and this limited edition poster. Can I just add one more thing to what you just said oh. because about the extending your baselines? Mm -hmm. um, the VLA was not involved, but ALMA was involved in the Event Horizon Telescope, which essentially connected radio telescopes all across the earth to get a baseline as large as the diameter of the earth, which is ridiculous. So maybe, you know, someday in the future, we're gonna link up the SKA and the VLA and ALMA and the VLBA and it's very exciting. That's right. Yeah. We already so regularly we link up the VLA with the VLBA. So the VLBA is stretched across all of North America with the 10 antennas. But sometimes we will have the VLA look at the same thing that the VLBA is looking at and sort of act as an 11th antenna. So those are already one thing that we regularly connect, but that's just the size of North America. So imagine connecting more telescopes across the world and it gets even bigger, even better resolution. That's it. Summer, best question. Um, so I'm a little torn because uh, I thought the calibration question was really great as far as um, calibrating both the dishes and then all of them together. Uh -huh. um, but I also, strangely enough, I feel like no one really ever asks how long the antennas last. And mm -hmm. so I thought that was a really good question. Well, um, I'll tell you what, because Luigi is, you know, just so, you know, in love with astronomy and space sciences, I think we'll send them some swag as well. Um, I so I if I, I'm going to put in the, um, I'm not sure if, we, you know, we have everybody's details captured um, through the registration, especially if they are on Facebook. So if you could send, um, I think that was. It's in the Zoom, so quickly. I think. Yeah, so. Camille asked about the, the um, calibration and reach about you know how long those those dishes last. So if you could send us your details to the email address in the chat, and we will make sure that you receive your limited edition NRAO swag 
from the United States of America. Yeah. Right, well, that brings to close um, today's session. Summer, Faith, thank you very much to you and your team um, for the tour today. Thank you for your time. And just as we wrap up, um, just to remind our viewers to stay tuned um, for tomorrow, the last day of SciFest Africa in collaboration with the SAO at 2 p.m. South African Standard Time. Um, there will be a lecture by the CEO of the South African National Space Agency, Dr. Velmoon Sami. Um, fantastic man, great lecturer. And he'll be talking about making sense of our world through space science and technology. So that's 2 p.m. You can register on the SciFest page. Um, and then probably the highlight for me, and really looking forward to it, tomorrow night at 7.30 South African Standard Time on the Facebook SciFest and SAO live pages only is the closing party of SciFest Africa. And uh, that will feature Master KG, who of course is the artist beyond, uh, behind the very, very popular Jerusa Luma uh, song. So, you know, get your Jerusa Luma steps ready and, uh, you know, enjoy that. So thank you again for joining us. And that brings the session to a close. Thanks for having us. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>